but you have to allow that natural behavior. And if you allow it, if you provide for it, if you allow that enrichment, you will be rewarded with an animal that is more balanced, that is better colored, that is healthier, that is more interactive. You see a different animal entirely. Yeah, um, it's because uh, they, they, are, they are programmed to do these behaviors, but if they're not given the enrichment, they won't do it because there's, not, there's no way for them to do it. And, you know, one of the really interesting things is that these animals do serve an ecological purpose. You know, they have that sort of micro niche in the wild that they, I mean, you talk about it in your book, right? There are certain things that these reptiles do in their native environment that helps the ecosystem function. And it's just sort of like their duty as an individual is to run through these activities. And if they're not given the opportunity to do that, it's going to affect them. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. I mean, every species has its place in the ecosystem. And, and it doesn't matter how many generations we breed away from the wild. You know, when you get through F1, F2 and going on and on and on and on and on, you will never, ever breed out those wild tendencies if you allow them to display them. You know, with this, uh, I'm, I'm quite excited about a, a large scale project that someone's setting up with uh, a group of one male leopard gecko wild type and five or six females in a very big enclosure all rock worked and live planted and grass you know the leopard gecko is not an it's not really even an arid species it's certainly not a desert species um uh, it's more of a they, they occur f- over such a vast geographical area right from semi-arid scrubland into emergent forest you know but they the, the leopard gecko the more you study the wild forms and there's five or six different subspecies um you know that's developed over millions of years all with slightly different needs and and uh, places in that ecosystem but they are always found in groups very rarely solitary you know it's a patriarchal society you get one alpha male and a group of um sort of alpha females really and then working in concentric circles away from that you'll have beta and beta females and younger males which the male will the alpha male will keep in check they use a communal latrine they all go to the toilet in the same place they are absolute opportunistic feeders You know, they will quite easily and happily consume each other as well as small beetles and crickets and birds, eggs and and whatever. There was this one scientific paper, really interesting um, sort of report on the species that shows two males will fight and the loser will offer up his tail to the to the winner and the, the, the male will eat the tail and wow. uh, and go off being fat rich and everything you can see the de- <laughs> the developmental sense there but if we kept a group of of leopard geckos in a really nice you know maybe six by five by three that kind of size so all natural slate and rock and scrubland plants and illuminated properly and you had a social system in there that fell that falls um, accurately within their natural social hierarchy, being patriarchal with a number of females, there is no reason at all why we wouldn't start to see more and more of their long-standing behaviour, the behaviour that occurs in their part of the ecosystem, come out in front of our eyes. You know, I, I've got a, a leopard gecko here that lives in a, a naturalistic system, um, which is fairly sizable it's not as big as i want it to be but we're allowing him place to climb we're allowing him places to um i mean literally climb vertically and uh, scoop along branches horizontally and find shade and find high levels of light and no light and you know a deep substrate and all the things that we want to do and i can tell you that leopard gecko is visible nearly every day climbing brush bushes you know they they do climb and they will climb and they are seen climbing in the wild. So why do we, why, why have we kept them on sand, which is fundamentally wrong in very shallow enclosures with very little enrichment and, and treated them as a purely terrestrial animal for the last 20 odd years. The only reason is because we could, 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like it's so, <laughs> it's so weird that there's this giant gap between the the captive animal and the wild counterpart. And like you said, these are these are not domesticated animals in the hobby. They are just wild this are descendants of the wild animals. They have the yep. same care requirements. And there's like these weird almost myths or memes that started maybe like 15 or 20 years ago of how to care for an animal and no one's ever checked up on it. They're just like, it should be good. You throw some sand down with like a backdrop of some red mountains and yes. that's your, and then a fake <laughs> cactus and there's your leopard gecko thing. Yeah. And no one went like, wait a minute, where are these in the wild and what does it look like? Or even worse, glow in the dark mushrooms. Have you seen those? <laughs> oh, yeah. Who thought that up? <laughs> I've exactly like where are those things coming from <laughs> no thank you for listening to that clip of the animals at home podcast if you found that interesting definitely go check out the full episode here you can also find any other episodes that we've recorded right here and we are available on your favorite podcasting app